Aloha and welcome to this Think Tech Hawaii show on Thursday, um, August 16th, 2021. You are watching the state of the state of Hawaii. I'm your host, Stephanie Stahl Dalton. Our show topic today is about education, education uh, in the pandemic and its effect on Hawaii schools, classrooms, and students. Well, parents and teachers too, actually. So everybody gets the same hit and the same success when it happens. So this show also takes uh, questions from the public, which uh, you would, uh, and viewers. So you should send in your question now, and I'll watch the screen for any that might come in. And it also responds to those uh, that have already been received to get to reach out and connect with um, the viewership. The questions are from parents um, and, um, and students concerned about education and schooling because of the pandemic um, and, and because of other things too. So parents and public do know what their students need to learn over every day and year of their growing up. And they want to know what education is learning to make post-pandemic classrooms when our time comes uh, in all schools better for everyone. So we're still in it and we might be in it for a while longer, but it will eventually get better, we all hope. So what parents ask, for example, is in um, the first question, so uh, we can look at the question listing. Um, parents ask, how do students learn collaboration, resilience, responsibility? Um, these are the skills that the workplace is demanding and that our students have missed in the past 18 months of no school open. What are schools going to provide? So for the past, as is mentioned in the question, 18 months, most American students lost the socializing experience of school, critical academic learning time, and on the benefit of teacher and student affiliation due to the school closings or participation in completely in online or virtual schooling. Now we all know the, pa the pandemic plateaued and we looked forward to gaining some normal time again, and maybe return to the normal schedule of schooling and life. Then, and then the cases increased recently and Hawaii's healthcare is again in crisis with effects on our schools. So what do we know about this pandemic in Hawaii? Briefly, um, the community transmission level of COVID is high for every island except Lanai, where it's substantial. So it's uh, just below high. So last Friday, Hawaii reported to the shock of everyone over 1,000 cases, new corona cases. And the, there were 1,167. And then there was sadly one new death. So the uh, on Oahu, we have 837 question, cases, and on Hawaii Island, we've got 151, and Maui has 109, Kauai has 48, and Molokai has six. Then there are 18 residents identified out of state. So what's really important to know is um, uh, that about 61% of Hawaii residents are fully vaccinated. And um, I was hoping that that was higher, but I, I guess it, it's going to climb as, as people take advantage of the opportunities to get vaccinated. But let's look at Hawaii's public and private schools reports of COVID data and, policy, and their policies about it. First, of course, I wanted to mention that um, on August 5th, uh, the governor uh, announced that all schools state and county workers would need to be vaccinated. So we have a mandate. Uh, and if they don't vaccinate, then they will undergo weekly testing and um, 
that's at their own expense. So that would apply to teachers and staff um, members as well, education staff members. So we call, recall that Hawaii gave teachers essential worker status in January, fortunately and, and correctly, and, uh, and that uh, teachers could be vaccinated and many, many were vaccinated with the first wave of vaccinations here in Hawaii um, at Blaisdell and out at the, um, at the uh, at Aloha Tower for the Pfizer and Moderna at, uh, at the uh, Blaisdell. But now at Hawaii's 257 public schools, the state has about 163,000 students who are not currently required to be inoculated unless they are involved in high school athletics. And of course, the young ones in the grades are not eligible for vaccination. Now at private schools, um, they like their public counterparts have worked hard to implement um, extra pandemic protocols all along. And these re include requirements for face masking, proper hand hygiene, staying home when sick and social distancing where social distancing were possible. Now among the private schools requiring a vaccine is um, the Iolani school where all eligible students, faculty and staff must be vaccinated or ask for a health or religious exemption. Iolani spokeswoman, uh, Michelle, he said the faculty and staff already have a 99% vaccination rate while eligible students in the upper school, that's grades seven through 12 are at 95%. So the school isn't requiring lower school vaccination um, because um, they would be uh, ineligible for a shot. All right, at Punahou, um, all eligible students and employees are required to, to either be vaccinated or to test on a weekly schedule. Um, we have also, they say, implemented a vaccine requirement for all students participating in interscholastic athletics with the exception of medical and religious exemptions. So at Punahou, more than 90% of their faculty, K-12 faculty are vaccinated and more than 85% of eligible students, those are the older levels, um, are vaccinated too. So at Island Pacific Academy in Kabulay, faculty, staff and administration are being required to receive COVID-19 vaccination or undergo weekly testing according to the school's newly released health and safety plan. Um, as for the students, the school strongly recommends they receive a, ma a vaccination um, if and, and when they become eligible. So the fact of the matter is that not every school has a COVID-19 vaccine mandate. Um, those that do not are mid Peck Institute, which started classes October 9th. The school spokesperson, Kevin Whitman, said the faculty at MidPAC has a 97% vaccination rate. MidPAC did not need to mandate vaccinations because their uh, incredibly high vaccination rate is, is there. So at Kamehameha schools, all campuses and preschools have returned to full person and in-person instruction after nearly a year and a half. And there is no vaccine mandate at the schools. At St. Louis School, there's also no such mandate. The faculty is already 95% vaccinated while the school is still trying to determine the vaccine rate for its student body of nearly 900. All right, let's look a little bit closer into Hawaii's pandemic classrooms. Those are classrooms in the pandemic, which have now social distancing and masking in place. So first, we've seen many photos of COVID mitigation efforts in the schools where, where students are socially distanced, masked, and have rules about inside, outside, um, and hand washing and the like following um, uh, Governor Ige's 
urging people to take personal responsibilities, uh, taking personal responsibility for their health. So um, what, what does that mean? Um, the next slide um, is uh, the, the, the slide of the, yes, world history class. Um, in this slide of uh, world, uh, world history class, we don't see actual masks and social distancing, distancing, but we can fill in the blanks, but we do the effects of, um, of these, these rules guiding and limiting uh, student behavior in the classroom as, as it was in, in years heretofore, certainly not recently, although some may have seen this. But the rules in the slide that the teacher's pointing to on the first day are um, guide and limit, um, are there to um, guide and limit students. But the slide, but those imitate and give rise, and they rise to create the same effects that responsible protections urged by the government, um, it seems. So those, those responsive protections are of course to reduce inter interaction among people, with students, uh, to social distance in the classroom organizations of rows and columns, and, um, and also to mask and cover the face. Um, these rules meant to control students' interaction, engagement, and community for the purpose of increasing concentration, which they believe would help to be, to be uh, increased by silence and close attention. It is the kind of setting once thought to promote the best and highest level of individual learning. We've come to refer to this more as a model uh, called the cemetery model of classroom organization because it is so silent and it is so um, organized in rows and columns just like the cemeteries are. Um, and there is no interaction at all in the cemetery model. Some of you may have parents that <laughs> recall experiences in this sort of classroom social organization. Um, as you know, today, some students um, under um, mitigate, using the mitigations find that masks are hard to breathe and the little ones are, are um, wonderfully brave to, to work on getting that to, to be okay for them. And they're also hard to talk through. So um, they are a little more quiet than maybe under the ordinary circumstances. Social distancing um, from three to six feet has students align like checkers on a board, uh, which constrains um, their interactivity and collaboration. But these mitigations are really necessary to everybody's health now. And as long as COVID is gonna stay around, which looks like it is for a while. So as you, as you well know, um, and have experienced, no doubt. The classrooms have uh, left, today's classrooms have left behind the cemetery model of classroom organization we saw in the world history class and developed into a much more active and engaging activity setting uh, for teaching and learning. Look at slide two, the final cartoon that draws a picture of 30 students, 24 to 30 students um, engaged in a variety of differentiated activities in what was considered um, and what was considered an ordinary kind of classroom social setting uh, for today's schools. Um, on, for for um, if we take a look at this um, in the oops in that classroom organization. Uh, we can see um, that, that there are numerous multi-level activities, tasks, and materials to support student learning, interaction, transaction, and allow teacher and student engagement in small, in small groups, small instructional groups with uh, fewer students than the whole class to, to really focus in on, on higher level thinking uh, and critical thinking. The teachers moved away from traditional classroom organization to these kinds of more um, socially responsive settings. And those that 
is just one variation of numerous ways teachers are socially organizing their classrooms. But parents ask a second question I have on the, the first question one. The second question that parents ask is, um, do schools want students to be creative and find their voices, discover their passions? What about academic learning goals, effective communication in social settings and in academic writing and speaking? I think that that final, that slide two with the cartoon slide shows students interaction, movement, collaboration and engagement when classrooms um, are more socially organized, which most of our classrooms have been. The schools um, uh, providing such settings for classrooms to develop the student skills, just as the parents asked. Um, but the concern is that currently distancing, social distancing practices may be inhibiting this level of um, complicated, more complicated, more complex student participation at all grade levels. And um, the advantages of this way of being in classrooms is, is a tremendous support for teachers to have all other um, interactions supporting um, the work that the teacher's doing with the students in, in various or, um, ways. So um, looking at the, the show slide, the, the slide three, it's called big comparison and contrast. So we can look at these two classrooms now, the world history classroom of yesteryear and the more modern um, socially organized uh, classroom of today. This classroom diagram shows the two bottles with students placement as access. Um, with social distancing, separators and masking imposed on any classroom arrangement, there are consequences for students learning opportunities. In the diagram, uh, students can engage and interact and use, um, in the diagram of today's classrooms, that they engage, interact, use social and academic language according to their tasks and activities um, needs and requirements. And uh, in, in the yesteryear or yesterday's classroom, as you look at that diagram, you can see that they're limited as to the movement in the interaction and, and the collaboration, but with anyone, but someone close to them. And these are opportunities lost that the newer version of social organization and classroom provides for students and for teachers to take advantage of for their students. <clears throat> well, what else do we know and um, see in pandemic classrooms? <clears throat> we see virtual, digital, or online learning serve as the mainframe of teaching in pandemic classrooms. Some students are engaged in, in this work well and, and do much of it at home. But does online digital activity, virtual uh, view, uh, use of computers replace rich classroom settings with peers and teachers? So one parent answers that question on the, on the question one uh, slide. The parent comments with, with the pandemic, what the pandemic showed me is that my child did better with the homeschool program versus virtual teaching that became distant and boring. As parents, we sacrificed, tried our best to teach and guide during pandemic, during the pandemic. If anyone deserves a bonus, it's not the teachers. It should be those parents that cared for their kids while students were closed. I was, um, while the schools were closed, I think that it's important to notice this parent is using um, these words to describe the, the virtual teaching experiences, making students feel distant and also students feeling bored. So how can technology, as we're going on here, and it might be for a while, um, how can technology be more encouraging of engagement 
with peers and teachers and what strategies and, and tactics uh, can, can we use? And also how to make sure the activities are compelling. Maybe that's something that technology does have a leg up on, but how do we learn more about making virtual online as dynamic as possible for all students learning? So parents also ask um, on, on question number four, which is on the first page again, is that the parent cites all of these programs, um, which um, the parent considers corporate interests and says, we need to consider, you know, the 21st century education, P21 Common Core. Uh, and what for, what, what are these electronic pes peasants? <laughs> but we need to consider the limiting nature of um, subjects, academic subjects shaped by corporate interests. Yes, students are not readily afforded credit bearing work opportunities in high school. To accomplish that task, more links between schools and communities must be established. For example, if there were an unused, an unused restaurant on, on state land close to a public high school, the restaurant should be made available to the school in order to provide credit bearing work opportunities in the restaurant in, industry. Such uh, link thinking is required to offer more academic experiences in um, public high school, especially. So if, if we are to continue um, in virtual schooling, which I, I fairly am certain we are with or without the pandemic, we do need for virtual online learning to support these kind of goals and, uh, and provide those circumstances for students to enjoy and learn from in the classroom. Um, if, if it's by computer stim simulations um, of such setting for students to work in or are we going to have more virtual reality needs met um, in our home schooling and or public classrooms? So the next question is about what parents and public, <clears throat> the public say they want in their schools and classrooms. So if you can show question number two scan, please readers comments are most people in Hawaii now have a new appreciation for teachers. That's a good sign. <laughs> Parents, principals, and teachers are working together probably closer than they ever have before. As such, we are in an optimal moment to look closely at our public education system and further develop our strengths as we discard the baggage that prevents us from providing a 21st century education to our P21 students. I think this is interesting that parents know what they want and their standards are high and their goals are huge for their youngsters and they want the schools to deliver on these um, objectives. Parents also ask uh, the question number six, uh, what does innovation in education look like? So are we going to operate on yesterday's crisis or look forward to making significant changes? So once again, they're setting um, up those goalposts and taking them beyond the end of the field uh, to, to make schools um, reach uh, bigger, the bigger picture. Um, and as long as um, social distancing and, and other um, of the mitigations are in place, they may hinder, hinder the human exchange and, and transactions in classrooms but maybe technology has ways to help bring this along. And it's, um, it is important to continue to explore how to include as much as possible what we know the social context for learning can supply for uh, teaching and learning in today's classrooms. So um, another parent comment um, about what is to be done is um, the talk about the parents saying the talk about reinventing and transforming education really bothers me. Everything about education that needed to be invented has been invented and finessed a long time ago. All we need to do is copy from the nation and schools that send the greatest numbers of graduates to the world's most academically rigorous universities such as MIT, Caltech, and all the rest of the uh, global uh, institutions. Um, now, this is, um, this is 
without recognizing the transformation in teaching and classroom organization that we've already discussed and uh, we have improved um, the work for all students. And uh, we know, we certainly do know that imitation of what these other institutions do as one of the great instructors and um, the parent identifies excellent models and uh, for teachers and policymakers to find matches in pro of programs and activities and, and strategies to, to meet um, the, the US needs um, and Hawaii's needs especially. Um, so let's talk about uh, the last question. How do parents get what they want in Hawaii schools? So the parent comment um, that leads to this question, uh, um, last one, is that on top of all that we've already had to say, we have resources given the news this week that um, there, we can use grant money. There's lots of grant money coming into Hawaii and the other states from the federal government. So um, the federal funding Hawaii received recently includes federal allocations through the CARES Act of um, about $227 million for the Department of Education and an additional uh, $51 million is coming from the governor, the governor's allocations. The, la the latest batch of federal funding to be distributed to the Department of Education is $412 million under the American Rescue Plan, Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. This is called ESSER. This is a total for Hawaii of $690 million. More information is on the department's website and more information should be shared once it has been processed through that bureaucracy and um, made available um, to the schools. In addition, um, in, on April 22nd, 2020, Hawaii was awarded over nine, almost $10 million in uh, federal re relief funding, which govern, Governor Ige used to form the Governor's Emergency Education uh, Relief Advisory Group, the relief group, it's called GEAR. And this group he is, he said, designed to collaborate and design Hawaii's approach to reinventing and transforming education during this challenging time. We are looking to fund programs, he says, that inspire and promote innovation in education. And I think that fits right into what Hawaii does well when, when it is released from impediments uh, like the um, mitigation that is in place now, but uh, we can do even better with that. And once we're free of that, this, these resources are really precious for making things happen in the way that we've talked about throughout this little chat and certainly for technology because to make technology meet the needs of our students and teachers um, in our schools, it takes money. <laughs> it's expensive to develop those programs and software and get what it is that this this state students really need. So keep an eye on the US Department of Education's website, as well as looking at what the governor and is doing and the, and the um, Board of Education um, um, on the website there too. And the re let's read the reports and we'll get back and talk more about what's going on with these enormous resources that may be more than Hawaii has seen in a long, long time. So the pandemic stimulates thinking and action for innovation. The advantage of US education um, in every state is of course that it's open to everyone. The advantage of federal funding can make new insights become innovations and available to everybody, including technology for all students benefit, especially when the budget is there to do it well. So it's aloha time for this, this show and um, I'll wrap it up. Thanks uh, so much for your attention 
and uh, for all of the questions that have been available. I am Stephanie Stoll Dalton, hosting for the State of the State of Hawaii. I'll see you next week. Same, uh, I'll see you in two weeks on Monday, two weeks. So mahalo, everyone.